So I'm going to ask you to give yourself a, a great hand to Peter Brown, who will give the opening talk, followed by John. Thanks very much for your vote. Uh, thank you very much, Andreas. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, and, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Thanks for the description of the project. So if you, you know, we're looking uh, for uh, additional very, very good students, uh, in addition to the ones we already have. And uh, if you have any spare checks or anything like that, you know, you don't have any nowhere to send them, you know, you can uh, send them up our way. Um, so um, I want to talk mainly about the um, unrealized uh, potential of ecological economics. Uh, Peter Victor's talk last night uh, stressed, I thought, brilliantly the possible analogy between where ecological economics is and the situation with the right-wing um, American situation it, um, that was brought up in the case of the Powell uh, memo. And um, so that's kind of a pointing out we lack a, a, a sort of a, a strategy for getting our agenda advanced. And I'm going to talk about something uh, analogous. Um, about, about the need really to reopen our minds to what philosophers would call metaphysics and ontology, or reopen our minds to uh, how we fit into to things from a cosmic perspective. So um, th this just uh, maybe a, a beautiful sort of a summary of my speech, and you know, if I could stop here, then I'd save uh, probably 15 minutes, but uh, we need to rethink uh, how, how we fit into the cosmos. Uh, we, we don't do that systematically. Um, and e ecological economics is, in, in my view, kind of somewhat uh, trapped by the paradigm it's trying to escape. And uh, I think uh, part of the remedy, though not the whole remedy, I is to uh, take, take a look at what science has to say about uh, the nature of the universe and the human place in it. It's quite a rich story now. Um, so what, what I'm going to talk about, and I'll try to leave uh, plenty of time for John for some questions, uh, really is... Um, we're, uh, we're embedded to, our, our self-understanding is embedded in a narrative uh, that is um, based on Judeo-Christian Greek premises um, and uh, has not been updated um, with respect to ecological economics for, uh, for uh, basically since these major changes in, in our understanding of the cosmos have occurred. We still suffer from the two cultures problem identified by C.P. Snow in the 1950s um, so the sciences are sort of advancing and uh, the, the social sciences and humanities are somewhat stalled for reasons that I'll talk about later and, and that John will also talk about. So um, the consequence of this is that um, higher education uh, is, is creating confusion and blocking progress in dealing with the challenges of the Anthropocene. Um, and uh, ecological economics is kind of a part of this pack, I think, in, uh, in not really uh, opening up the possibilities of a different understanding if, if you took the fundamental premise of ecological economics seriously, which is we have to base economics on science. And so I'm just extending that model a, a bit to say we have to basically revise our self-conception uh, based on science. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about really um, two, two uh, world, world views and, and how they're in, in, in kind of submerged conflict in our culture. Uh, first, um, I'm calling um, the Emancipation Project after the, um, a book, I got this idea from a book by um, Horkheimer and Adorno called The, the Dialectic of Enlightenment. Um, and the Emancipation Project has the, the sources I, that I mentioned here on the slide and then of course it's been in, in uh, tension with the scientific synthesis of the last 500 years, but with uh, particular um, advances in, in uh, this kind of understanding in the post-World War II period. And so what, what much of what we do in society and much of what we teach in universities is still rests on worldview number one, um, for which, uh, well, never mind that. Um, so the Emancipation Project um, has, has these um, characteristics. Um, meant we, free, we attempt to free ourselves from nature, we attempt to free ourselves from obligations to others, and that we think that we can remodel the, the self, right? Uh, that that we, can, we, can, we can make the human self fit the needs of society. And in our, our culture, of course, uh, the way that's done is to conceive of the, of the human as, as a, 
um, a consumer rather than a citizen, right? So, so the, the job of, of people in, in contemporary so-called advanced societies is, is to consume a lot to keep the macroeconomic um, system going. Um, the, the Emancipation Project has been enabled by a, a number of, of uh, physical factors, uh, the rise of agriculture, the, the rise of um, the development and use of money, po massive population growth and so forth. Uh, but what I'm going to talk about here mainly is the, um, the way the human self-conception has uh, shaped and it worsened the current situation. Um, so the, the, the Emancipation Project starts with the assumption that, that humans are uh, different from and superior to uh, the, the rest of the natural world. And um, I, I'm going to follow an analysis that um, Carolyn Merchant has done uh, about the way uh, the Judeo-Christian part of this story has, uh, has really legitimated and facilitated uh, the, the decline in Earth's life support systems. Um, so, so this, um, I mean, her, her argument's really, really very simple. Um, there are the, the story of the fall represented in here in this uh, painting. Um, humans, our Adam is created in the image of God. Uh, Eve is created by God uh, as a way that's derivative of Adam, taken, taken from his rib. And then um, on, the, on the right hand side here, you can see that uh, that Eve is, is a story, you know, the, the temptation, and that, that Eve in, in this painting has, has two heads. Um, one connected to the woman, and the other one further to the right connected to a snake. Right? So, um, you know, this kind of gets, from a point of view of uh, gender equality, this may think, get things off in a little bit of a wrong start. Um, and in this narrative, as everyone knows, God is, is, um, makes man in his image and gives the earth uh, to men and the sons of men, not, not to humans, by the way, um, as a gift for, uh, for our use. Uh, in the Middle Ages, this conception came, uh, got, got embodied in the, in the notion of the great chain of being, with uh, God as at the top, uh, and um, that, that's the most holy, the most honored thing, and uh, that's the origin of everything else, and then at the bottom is rocks and sand and other things like that. So uh, in, in this narrative, according to Carolyn, um, the, the job is to, to get back to paradise. Um, and in the, as you recall, in, in, the, in the story of the fall, not only are humans are thrown out of the garden, but nature itself is degraded, right? So, so the world post-fall is, is something that is in need, need of improvement. And in the, um, um, in the development of, of modern science coming flowing from Francis Bacon and many other people, um, this narrative is continued by saying that through the arts and sciences, we can retake our place in paradise, right? And th this is the, the sort of uh, the more modern version of, of the Emancipation Project. And when capitalism and, um, and the technical advances of the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment period uh, come along, this is what makes the whole process possible. So what, what's happened is we have a global doctrine, I, I think still in pretty, pretty uh, regrettably in pretty good force, that uh, there's a chosen species, that's us, obviously. Uh, there's a chosen people, that's the, the enlightened people. And um, the mechanisms of this have been uh, empire, colonialism, uh, the development project uh, for, and, and free trade. And in, in some ways, we're going to talk later on about the orphan disciplines. And I'll uh, just give a little pre preview there. In some way, the orphan disciplines are, at least in my opinion, are the foot soldiers of the new, new forms of, of colonialism. Uh, so here's a fantastic picture that sort of represents a lot of these ideas in one place. Uh, probably a lot of people have seen this picture before. Um, the, uh, to the right of the picture, you can see this where, is Europe, where Europe would be. Uh, you can see the Brooklyn Bridge. And uh, so Europe is a source of enlightenment. So it's dark where the, where the um, Aboriginal or First Nations people have li been living. Um, and the, the job of progress is to drive them off the land and to drive the, the uh, other species off the land. And, and it's been, um, unfortunately, uh, working rather well. 
Um, but you can see that the whole project has actually been completely successful, right? Um, so th th this is, um, I guess that well, most everybody in this room would, or many people in this room would know what this is. This is the Edmonton Mall, right? It's, um, it is paradise reconstructed, right? It's warm, palm trees, place to go swimming, right? And, and, you, can, uh, and you can get potato chips and Diet Pepsi anytime you want, right? So this is, this is sort of perfection. Um, and, and, but but Car Carolyn's argument is that, that the Judeo-Christian narrative has legitimated uh, the transformation of the entire earth in the attempt to get back to our original and rightful place in paradise. So there, um, there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of, of features of this, are, of this view that, that have, I think, helped to create the mess. Um, we, we have, um, first place, we have a, a, in Judeo-Christian thought, we have a very strong uh, ontological dualism. Um, that, that humans are separate in, in, in kind from uh, all other animals, and plants and animals. Um, the uh, <clears throat> sacred is located principally in, in the transcendent. Um, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It says a lot, right, that the, that the sacred isn't here, right, the sacred is somewhere else. And in, in the, um, in, this, in the talk last night that, that was emphasized uh, by, by the uh, representative of First Nations, emphasized that the, the sacredness of, of, what the, of what's here, the present, and uh, this, this is not a, a strong, it's not an absent feature from Judeo-Christian thought, it's just not strong. Um, the earth has fallen and needs in reclamation, so if you look at the name of the Bureau of Reclamation, rec reclamation is part of the Army Corps of Engineers, is to da repair the damaged earth. Um, the human-earth relationship is one of property, um, and there's no balance here between the requirements of humans and other species or future generations, um, and it lacks uh, traction with the problems of the Anthropocene. So it's kind of a, of a mess, and it's creating, um, in, in the view of in taking Carolyn and other arguments similar to that, it's, it's a major contributor to the crises of the Anthropocene. Um, so I'm going to talk now about um, an alternative worldview and just a little bit about universities and then turn it over to John. Uh, this, this is a slide that would surprise no one, right, except maybe um, neoclassical economists, right? Um, so we're, we're um, you know, we're part of, of, of the universe. Um, I, I'm wondering, by the way, I was, uh, whether we should stop using the word neoclassical economists because most people except people like us don't know what that means. Um, and use the word lethal, right? Um, <laughs> but I decided not to print that here, right? So, uh, being American, I'm always wary of being sued. Um, so, so what, what we've done in uh, our project, and where I think there's a very promising literature developing, is to try to frame uh, things, in ter frame, fr frame the, the curriculum, and frame our understanding in terms of what's called uh, big history, and this is a kind of complicated slide. But the, main, the main idea is that history started 13.8 billion years ago and that, that we, we have ways of understanding this as a kind of continuum. Um, and we should begin to place ourselves, our institutions and our aspirations uh, within, within, that, within that understanding. So this is just a key, well, to go to the, that's just a diagram of the big bag. This, I don't want you to bother to read this. Um, in, in the, um, David Christian, who's head of the Big History Institute at Macquarie University in Sydney, and, and an important uh, collaborator and important partner with our project, the Economics of the Anthropocene, uh, has writ written a book called Maps of Time. And, and the basic argument of the book, is, and of this whole school of thought, is that there are, uh, that the universe is getting more complex uh, overall, because there's sort of thresholds of opportunity to support complexity uh, against the sort of cataract of, uh, of entropy. Um, and that, that um, you can look at history as this kind of a, a steps, history of the universe as kind of steps up this ladder. Um, so just a few things about what this worldview says. Um, 
The um, one, one is that there is a the process of continuous creation, right? Creation isn't something that happened at a particular time um, and then stopped. There, the way the, the, the universe works is it's, there's continuous creation of, of new, uh, new suns or new stars. Um, the um, medieval view has uh, got things uh, backwards. Um, the universe, as far as we know, doesn't proceed from mind, right? The universe is, uh, is a great chain of becoming, right? So it's actually rocks and dirt and sand that come first, and mind that comes, comes second, or comes, comes out of the process. Um, and and um, so looked at from, from this point of view, uh, biological evolution is a special case. Um, with just fitting into a, a sort of macro evolutionary process. A uh, book that uh, influenced me a lot is by Eric Chasson called The Epic of Evolution. Um, a principal descriptor of this evolutionary process is the second law of thermodynamics, so it fits very well into the sort of general framework of ecological economics. And this law describes the processes that reduce temperature and other gradients. Um, and to do this, uh, the universe uses uh, dissipative structures and self um, and self-organizing entities. So if there's a hurricane uh, in the Atlantic now. I guess it's offshore quite a bit, but that's an example of uh, something that's a, a massive heat dissipator uh, that is that is kind of self-organized itself and and is trying to deal with the tremendous amount of energy that is arriving. Um, arriving for, um, to the Earth every day from the sun. And in, in this uh, evolutionary concept, uh, mind and, and spirit, I, I like the word spirit, probably not everybody does, are emergent properties that are implicit in it from the beginning. Um, mind is widespread. Um, there's mind isn't limited to human beings. Other creatures, um, plants and animals, have minds or mind-like things. And um, the, the fundamental unit, uh, the fundamental sort of nature of the universe is, is energy um, and the notion that there are individual objects, right, doesn't find any uh, friendly footing in this, in this way of thinking about things. The only thing that might be uh, an isolated thing is the universe itself, and that would only be if there's no other universes, which we don't know about, right? So, um, so just looked at this way, uh, the Earth um, is an island of complexity in an entropic universe, and life, is, life on Earth is made up of encoded dissipative structures which handle the massive amounts of sunlight that continuously arise. So if you sort of uh, do a little scorecard on how, how this looks, if you're moving, moving from a Judeo-Christian Greek uh, framework to this big history framework, is you have um, a lot less to work with, right, in some ways, a lot, a lot less to build the, the, the conceptual and emotional moral foundations of your culture. So I just want to quickly go through this. You've got um, the Earth isn't rare nor central to the universe. The, the number of places that could support life uh, appears to be very large. Whether they do, we don't know. Uh, there's, no, there's no chosen people. Um, and there's no argument that the birth of an additional human person is intrinsically valuable. There may be all kinds of reasons for wanting to, or taking joy in the birth of a new, uh, of a new child, but, but you don't get the, the Christian argument that uh, because God has made, man has made in the image of God, more human births is intrinsically valuable, uh, sort of theologically. Um, there's no divine mandate that humans own the earth. There's, no, there's unity of mind and body, um, so there's no personal immortality. There's no exogenous rescue. Um, nobody's going to come and straighten out this mess from somewhere else. There's no ex cathedra uh, moral system. Um, <clears throat> morality is uh, contextual, and it, and it arises um, as an embedded, uh, embedded process in culture and in, in the biophysical evolution of the planet itself. Um, women are not inferior to men nor their property, and there's no gift of a savior and no virgin birth. Um, so so what, sort of where we are then is to try to think about how we could abandon, uh, radically alter the Emancipation Project and get onto uh, another project called, uh, John and I are calling the Reconciliation Project, 
And I'll just say a couple of things about how this affects um, higher ed. Um, so um, one, one metaphor I, I like to use for describing the situation of higher education comes from a movie by Peter Sellers called The Magic Christian, where he's a, um, the, plays the richest man in the world. He's having a meeting of the board on a train, of his, of his boards on the train, and, he, and all his companies are losing money. So he says, uh, gentlemen, you're all fired, and uh, they, they get off the train. It's somewhere nowhere. Central Yorkshire, seems to me. But, um, and uh, as he get off, he hands each of them a map. But none of them are maps of where they are. Right? They're just maps. Right? They're just pieces of paper. You know, map of downtown Auckland, right? a map of Cincinnati, right? uh, but no maps of Yorkshire. And so I think that's what we're doing with higher ed. Right? Uh, you know, as, as the students walk across the stage, we hand them, hand them a piece of paper, but it isn't you know, a piece of paper about where they are, depending on sort of what branch they've gone. If they've gone into social sciences, I think the chances of having a non-useful map are higher than if they've, than if they've uh, studied in, in, the, um, in the sciences. Not that I think the social science, well, well, John will come back to how, how some of this, this could be fixed. So, um, so um, anyway, we're, we're, uh, we need to switch the things so that higher education is not a, a, an additional threat to ourselves and other living things in the Anthropocene but can become a, a, a friend of it. Um, so we've, we've put up this now rather famous um, quote from um, Crutzen, et cetera. And so a metaphor for thinking about how higher education is working um, is that we're sort of devouring the, our own children in this way, right? We're, we're creating a world and, a, and educating people uh, in a manner that isn't um, actually conducive to what's needed. So uh, we came up with the metaphor of an orphan discipline, which will there'll be a session on this um, later later in the in the program. Um, so it's um, it's just an analogy, and a, a human uh, orphan is a person whose parents have died. A discipline of is an orphan if its metaphysical and scientific assumption has collapsed, but it is still has substantial influence on what we do and what we teach. And um, <coughs> Then uh, what, are, what are the orphan disciplines? It's a, it's a bit hard to say, but uh, the ones that we've uh, chosen to focus on are five that are explicitly normative, uh, economics, finance, law, governance, and ethics. Um, and of course, these, these have a tremendous influence on other disciplines, such as engineering, animal sciences, forestry, and so forth. So uh, the, the mischief that's being done is, is really uh, extends pretty far and wide in the curriculum. And uh, John's going to straighten the whole mess out. 